Well, please open your Bible at Isaiah and chapter 53. We're looking today at verse 7. This is the last week in our present series on Isaiah and chapter 53. We will return, God willing, to this marvelous uh, chapter uh, sometime in the fall. Now, uh, over these last weeks, we have seen that God will bring about a great restoration of everything that was lost through the entrance of sin into the world. Jesus bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. And he did that so that we might live in a world of peace and love and joy where grief and sorrow will be no more. We saw that Jesus purchased this restoration and he did it by means of substitution. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And Jesus endured all of this because our sins were laid on him. Now, this is what happened at the cross from the perspective of God the Father. What was God the Father doing when Jesus went to the cross? Well, Isaiah tells us right here in verse 6 that we looked at last time, the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. And we saw this is the language of transfer. This is God taking our sins from one place and putting them in another. He gathered together all of our transgressions, all of our sins, all of our iniquities. What did he do with them? He laid them on his own son, Jesus Christ. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was our substitute. He stood in our place. Our sins were imputed to him. They were laid on him. They were counted as his. And the sentence that would have been on us, well, it was on him. And this is how we have peace with God. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. So we've been learning together that Jesus purchased our restoration and he did this by means of substitution and imputation. Now, every doctrine in the Christian faith has come under attack and this will continue until Jesus Christ himself puts a stop to it when he returns in power and in glory. And the truth that we've been focusing on from Isaiah chapter 53 over these last weeks goes to the very center and heart of the gospel itself. And so it should not come to us as any surprise at all that this doctrine has been a focus of sustained attack. Now, the assault on this truth that we've been looking at from the Bible really comes in three successive waves. The first wave of the assault is to deny the severity of sin. See, the biblical doctrine of sin tells us that there is something seriously wrong with us. Our transgressions, our iniquities, our defiance, our twistedness. But you see, this doesn't fit well with a world of affirmation. So it's very tempting simply to ignore the entrance of sin into the world and to replace original sin with original goodness. So you might hear someone say, well, the Bible says that God made everything good. I mean, sure, none of us are perfect, but is it not the case that at heart we are essentially good? And then what follows in the second wave of assault on this great truth that we're looking at in the Bible is a denial of the reality of judgment. Jesus enduring punishment in our place. Well, that tells us very clearly that there is a judgment. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Peace. 
But you see, that points to the very disturbing reality that there's a hell as well as a heaven. And that people who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will go there. So you see, it's very tempting then to simply ignore all that the Bible says about punishment and then replace God's judgment with God's acceptance. So, so you might hear someone say, well, doesn't the Bible say that God is love? And sure, we all need some sorting out, but is it not the case that God in the end will welcome us all into his heaven? And then after denying the severity of sin and after denying the reality of judgment, the third wave in this assault is to deny substitution itself. And you may hear people say something like this. Well, this idea of Jesus being our substitute, is it not simply a theory? Him paying the penalty him paying the price, him becoming the substitute and bearing our sins. That's just one way of thinking about the cross. And since it relates to sin and punishment in which we no longer believe, it's a way of thinking about the cross in which we, uh, that we can now easily discard. But I want you to take in what Isaiah the prophet actually says. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. And it was for our iniquities. Friends, that is substitution. And speaking under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Isaiah states it not as a theory, but as a fact. And when Isaiah says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, he's not speculating about what might happen at the cross. He's declaring under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit what God has actually done. And when Isaiah speaks about the chastisement or the punishment that was upon Jesus, he's not announcing any theory He's describing the brutal reality of what actually happened at the cross. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Now, friends, it is certainly possible for people to say that they don't believe what Isaiah says. I mean, that would hardly be surprising because if you look back to verse 1, the prophet himself begins the chapter by saying, who has believed our message? No surprise if people don't believe this. But the plain and obvious message of Isaiah is that Jesus became our substitute. He stood in our place. Our sins really were laid on him. And we have peace with God because the punishment that was due to us was on him. Now, today we come to verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, very clearly what this verse is telling us is that when Jesus went to the cross, he did not object, he did not complain. Jesus knew that what he suffered was in the will of the Father for him and his own will was completely aligned with the will of his Father. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane how Jesus wrestled with us and then he prayed, not my will but yours be done. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? You remember that when Jesus was arrested, 
A short time later, in that garden of Gethsemane, Peter was ready to resist. He drew his sword. And Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And then Jesus said, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels Well, you see, Jesus could have stopped the process of his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion at any moment if he chose to do so. But he chose not to do that. Why? Because in all that Jesus suffered, his will was completely aligned with the will of his Father. And friends, that is the very clear point of this verse. Jesus was oppressed and he was afflicted. He was oppressed in his unwarranted arrest. He was afflicted in a supposedly legal process that was a flagrant abuse of power. And yet, Isaiah says, he opened not his mouth. When false witnesses testified against Jesus in the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, Mark tells us Jesus remained silent and he made no answer. Then when Jesus was accused before Pontius Pilate, Matthew tells us he gave no answer. Pilate was amazed, said to Jesus, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. You can see Pilate looking at Jesus and he he can't make any sense of it. No one remains silent against accusations like these. Then Pilate sent Jesus off to Herod, And it was exactly the same. Herod asked Jesus many, many questions and Luke records, but Jesus made no answer. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter and as Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now notice that Isaiah says twice, he opened not his mouth. Now we know that Jesus spoke seven times from the cross. We know that Jesus told Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, I've come into this world to bear witness to the truth and everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So Isaiah is not saying here that Jesus never spoke during his trial or that he never spoke during his crucifixion. The point is, that Jesus said and did nothing that would save him from going to the cross. And why was this? Because the will of Jesus was completely aligned with the will of his Father. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? The suffering is in the will of my Father for me, It is part of his purpose. He will use it to bring about my own ultimate good and the blessing of all who will believe in me. And so I will not complain. I will not object. I will not fight. I will not resist. Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Now, friends, I want to apply this very important verse of Scripture to us in three ways today. The first is I want us to see that the submission of Jesus, that is the heart of this verse, answers a pressing question. 
I want us to see that the submission of Jesus models a distinct calling. And I want us to see that the submission of Jesus opens a compelling prospect. First then, the submission of Jesus answers a pressing question. Now, Isaiah says in verse 5, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. He tells us in verse 6 that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, someone will say, and you may have heard this charge being made, are you telling me that God the Father punished his dearly loved son Jesus for sins he did not commit? Isn't that the most grotesque perversion of justice? What kind of father would do this to his own son? And you may have heard this question raised in regard, of course, to the story of Abraham and Isaac. You remember the story of how father and son went up the mountain and Abraham laid his son Isaac on the altar. He was ready to offer his son as a sacrifice to God. What kind of father would do that to his son? It's a really important question. And I've been greatly helped on this by A.W. Pink, who points out that Isaac would have been a young man when he climbed the mountain with his father Abraham. So please try and forget any artistic impressions that you may have seen of a, a young child lying helplessly strapped onto an altar. Isaac was a man in the prime of life and he could easily have overpowered old Abraham who was more than 100 years old at this time. But Isaac didn't do that. Why? Because Isaac, as a mature man probably in his 30s, was ready to lay down his own life. And what you have in that remarkable and disturbing story in Genesis in chapter 22 is the story of a father who is willing to give up his son and a son who is willing to lay down his own life and that at one in doing what is needed to bring blessing to the world. Now, of course, God did not allow Abraham to give up his own son. But God did what Abraham and Isaac could only illustrate. God the Father gave up his dearly loved son for us. God the Son gave himself for us. And that surely is the point of verse 7. And that's why it comes here in Isaiah chapter 53. In verse 6, Isaiah has told us what happened at the cross from the perspective of God the Father. The Lord laid on him the iniquities of us all. And then immediately, so that there's no misunderstanding, Isaiah tells us what happened at the cross from the perspective of God the Son he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. God the Father and God the Son were at one in doing what it took to redeem you and to redeem me. And you may like to ponder this question, though you'll never be able to answer it. Which is harder, to lay down your own life or to give up the life of one you love? God experienced 
both agonies at the same time. God the Father did not spare his own son, but in an agony of heart, he gave him up for us all. And God the Son gave himself. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. He says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. He chose to do it. And he did it because Father and Son were at one in doing all that was needed for this great restoration to be brought about and for you and me to be part of it. The love of God is displayed at the cross because there at immeasurable cost to the Father and to the Son, God accomplished that which is of infinite value to us. He saved us. He redeemed us. He reconciled us to himself. So this submission of Jesus that we see so clearly in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7, it answers a very pressing question. And secondly, the submission of Jesus models a very distinct calling. Now, if you turn to 1 Peter in chapter 2, you will see that the end of that chapter in the New Testament is really an apostolic exposition or explanation of the verses that we are looking at in Isaiah and chapter 53. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, we read these, these words, For to this you have been called... Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Now, Peter is telling us here very clearly that the submission of Jesus, stated so clearly in verse 7 of Isaiah 53, that this is actually a model for us. Jesus aligned himself completely with the will of the Father and God calls us to do the same. So Peter is writing to Christian believers and he says, to this you have been called. In other words, as a Christian, you have a distinct calling from God. We share this calling together to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and to do it especially when we suffer. Now, we all suffer, of course, in many ways, but Peter is speaking especially about times when we, like Jesus, suffer injustice. Verse 19, he says, It is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly unjustly. Jesus suffered unjustly, and that will be part of our experience too. Now, here's the question. What would it look like to follow the example of Jesus when we suffer? And I want you to notice that Peter identifies two temptations that come to us when we suffer unjustly. The first is the temptation to revile. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Now, this word revile, of course, is where we get our word revulsion, which gives you a sense of it. To revile another person is to treat them with absolute disdain and contempt, to renounce them to view them with absolute disgust, to revile. And if you suffer unjustly, you will be tempted to revile the person who caused you to suffer. Anger and resentment will come knocking on the door of your heart and bitterness, hardness of heart, and even hatred will not be long behind. 
That's the first temptation that will come to you when you suffer unjustly. And notice the second that Peter makes very clear. It is to threaten. When Jesus suffered, he did not threaten. Now, think about how Jesus could have threatened the soldiers who nailed him to the cross. You're doing this to me now, but the day of judgment is coming. Just you wait. But Jesus didn't do that or anything like it. Instead, as they nailed him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Jesus was repeatedly wronged. He suffered one injustice after another, and he was innocent more than any of us could ever be. But he did not threaten, and he did not revile. And Peter says, to this, you've been called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Now, here's the obvious question. How in the world is that possible? How is it possible for a person who has suffered serious injustice not to be filled with anger, bitterness, a desire for revenge. How is it possible for ordinary people like us to become like Jesus in his suffering? And that takes us to the last thing that I want us to see in this remarkable verse today, that the submission of Jesus opens a compelling prospect. And friends, it's on my heart that if ever there was something needed in our world today as a distinctive witness to Jesus, this is it. If you were to pick one word that described the mood of our times, I wonder what word you would pick. I think I would choose the word angry. And I want you to imagine this for a moment. Imagine a community of people who follow the example of Jesus in how he suffered. Imagine the impact of that. Imagine the impact of a community of people who when they suffer do not become bitter. When they're treated unjustly, they don't revile. They don't threaten. They choose to love rather than hate. You say, how is that possible? And the answer surely is twofold in the scriptures here. It's possible when the Holy Spirit lives within you. Following the example of Jesus is not something that any of us can do in our own strength. But you know, it is possible when the Holy Spirit lives within you. Peter uses a very striking phrase, and he uses it twice here. First in verse 19, he says, this is a gracious thing. A gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. He says, it's a gracious thing. Now, that, that's more than simply you being gracious. It means that something has been given to you that you did not have in yourself. The Holy Spirit is reproducing in you the very likeness of Jesus. And then this is so important that Peter says it again in the very next verse, verse 20. For if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. It's something that's given to you. You've received something that you would not have had simply in and of yourself. When you act like Jesus, you give evidence that the Spirit of Jesus 
the Holy Spirit of God himself lives in you. And the compelling prospect of a community of people who follow the example of Jesus is possible, not only when the Holy Spirit lives in you, but secondly, when you know that God is just. If you're going to follow the example of Jesus, this is what you need to know. You have to know in a world of so much injustice that there really is a God who is just. And do you see that that's what Peter says right here about Jesus? When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. How? He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. You see what Peter is saying? How was it that Jesus did not revile? How was it that he did not threaten? How was it that he overcame the dark powers of anger and bitterness and resentment and hatred that threaten to possess our souls when we are treated with injustice? Well, he overcame it because he knew that God is just and he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And notice this was not like a decision that was made in one point of time and then it was all fine there afterwards. No, Peter makes it very clear. He continued to do this. He had to do it again and again and again. When he was betrayed by one of his own disciples, Jesus trusted himself to the Father who judges justly. And when he was falsely accused, he trusted himself into the hands of the Father who judges justly. When there was no justice for him in the court of Pilate, what did he do? He trusted himself into the hands of the Father who judges justly. And when he endured unimaginable physical pain, what did he do? He trusted himself into the hands of the Father who judges justly. Justly, there will be justice for me. And there was. On the third day, the Father raised him up from the dead and exalted him to the highest possible place. Now, as we bring this to a conclusion today, let me ask you this very practical question. What is going on in your life that might tempt you to become angry, resentful, or even bitter toward God or towards another person? What is there going on in your life that may face you with these temptations? We all suffer in various ways and we all face injustice at various points in our lives. Now, how are you going to respond? God calls you to do what Jesus did. He aligned himself with the will of the Father, and that's why he did not revile, and that's why he did not threaten. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? God's Holy Spirit is given to you so that you may follow the example of Jesus. And here's how you gain victory over the dark powers that threaten your soul. You trust your suffering into the hands of God. You believe that he is just that he will do what is right and you leave him to deal with those who oppress and afflict you. And then you ask that by his Holy Spirit, he will give you all that you need so that you will be able to shine 
like a light in this dark and angry world because you follow the example of Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, how can we begin to measure the breadth and length and height and depth of your great love towards us? That Father and Son and Holy Spirit united as one would plan our salvation and bring it about. You, our Holy Father, giving up at unfathomable cost your own dearly loved son for us. Your dear son giving himself in immeasurable suffering that we might be redeemed. We bow before you in worship and in awe and in thanksgiving, and in praise. We are your people. And we bow before you, recognizing that we have a very distinct calling in this world. Father, make us more like Jesus, especially when we suffer, we pray, and grant, Father, that therefore we may shine like lights because there is evidence of your Spirit in us and of living faith that trusts you even in the hardest things of life. So glorify your own name in and through us and hasten the day when faith will be turned to sight and all that Jesus died to accomplish for us will be ours forever and forever. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.